On January 16, 1970, after being traded from the St. Louis Cardinals to the Philadelphia Phillies, Kerfoot filed a lawsuit against baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn after Kuhn refused to let him become a free agent. The conflict lie in baseball's antitrust exemption and the reserve clause in players' contracts that kept their careers hostage by team owners. Aided by players' executive Marvin Miller, Flood's case traveled to the Supreme Court but was defeated in a 5-3 vote in favor of Major League Baseball. Compromise for Flood's case, however, would come later with increased emphasis on collective bargaining featuring a third-party arbitrator. This would lead to Andy Messersmith and Dave McNally being granted free agency in 1975 and the construction of the Basic Agreement of 1976 that would officially introduce free agency into baseball and inspire a movement that would change how professional sports players are compensated. Kurt Flood wasn't the first person to challenge baseball's antitrust exemption or its reserve clause. Enter Baseball 1922. Monopolies. The National and American Leagues were quickly buying out Federal League teams. When the Baltimore Terrapins, one of the last remaining Federal League teams, tried to argue that the MLB was violating Sherman's antitrust laws, in the Supreme Court, Justice Holmes clarified that baseball's exhibitions were, quote, purely state affairs, meaning baseball's activities weren't those of a business monopolizing, but of a sport protecting its game. In 1953, George Toulson, a minor league player, argued that baseball's monopoly ensured the reserve clause's ability to offer unfair contract deals that he had to accept, to which the Supreme Court said that only Congress could change the MLB's organization. The reserve clause would continue to be a sticking point. It began in 1879, when William Hubert, a coal magnate turned baseball owner, wrote up the clause to control players' careers and protect management. It was effective. Once a player signed with a team, the team could renew the contract and salary for a player every year, even if no agreement was reached. Players didn't have a say in being traded, and retirement was usually the only way a player could be released from their contract. Kirk Flood wasn't having it. Leading up to his case, Flood began his major league career in 1958 with the St. Louis Cardinals and spent 12 years as an outfielder with them. He faced discrimination, being a black player in a predominantly white sport. He was an exceptional player for his time though, receiving seven Golden Glove awards and leading the Cards to the World Series three times in 1964, 67, and 68. Flood's demonization began with him being a black man who thought he deserved more than what he received. $77,500, Kurt Flood's salary in 1968. After a great season in 1969, Flood requested a $10,000 raise, but was denied one while his right teammate received one. After asking the general manager about it, he was told that white people required more money to live than black people. Needless to say, he sat out of spring training until he became one of the highest paid players with a salary of $90,000. However, a year later, Flood's batting average slipped to a 285 as the cards fell to fourth place. Management then retaliated and Flood became part of a seven-player trade between the St. Louis Cardinals and the Philadelphia Phillies. Meanwhile, Bowie Kuhn was being primed by the owners to become the next baseball commissioner, meaning he would be in charge of resolving player-owner conflicts and defending the reserve clause system. And that's who Flood wrote to when he first resisted the trade. After 12 years in the major leagues, I do not feel that I am a piece of property to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. I believe that any system which produces that result violates my basic rights as a citizen and is inconsistent with the laws of the United States. It is my desire to play baseball in 1970, but I believe I have the right to consider offers from other clubs before making any decisions. I therefore request that you make known to all major league clubs my feelings in this matter and advise them of my availability for the 1970 season. Sincerely yours, Chris Flood. 
McEwen rejected Sled's request for free agency. On January 16, 1970, Sled sued Major League Baseball. Sled claimed that the reserve clause violated federal and state antitrust laws, civil rights laws, laws prohibiting peonage and slavery, including the 13th Amendment. To questions about his $90,000 salary, he responded, a well-paid slave is still a slave. It was a controversial stance that would leave Flood without the support of his teammates, who feared the retaliation of management. However, Flood was in good company. Joined by players executive Marvin Miller and former Supreme Court Justice Arthur Goldberg, they were determined to stand by the case and win one for the players. The boys took the MLB to federal court in May and June of 1970. However, Judge Irving Cooper would rule in favor of Kuhn's MLB for a few reasons. Since a player could retire, no compulsion was involved in the player contract. Since baseball was exempt from federal antitrust laws, it was exempt from state antitrust laws as well. And finally, Judge Cooper concluded that conflicts between owners and players could be resolved in collective bargaining within the players' union. No need for court. The appeals court held much the same opinion, but Flood kept pushing the case, and after submitting it to the Supreme Court, a hearing occurred on March 20, 1972. It was Flood's last chance. For Justice Blackman, who gave the court opinion, it was a case of, quote, stare decisis double dip. The court had already twice decided that baseball was exempt from antitrust laws, and this time was no different. Flood's case lost in a 5-3 vote, and Flood's fight was now at an end. The case had cemented it. The courts could not strike down the reserve clause. The loss was a blow for Flood. After sinking thousands of dollars into court hearings, he was broke and on the brink of alcoholism. Although he briefly entered back into baseball with the Washington Senators, the death threats he received from baseball fans and the retaliation he faced from management forced him to leave after half a season. I had decided myself ready to make sacrifices for a principle, and now I was finished. Baseball, the best thing I did in the world, was finished. However, all was not lost for baseball. As Marvin Miller would put it, much more important, what Flood vs. Kuhn really accomplished was raising the consciousness of everyone involved in baseball. Even in the year 1970, the collective bargaining agreement was already becoming part of baseball's basic agreement. The basic agreement of 1976 shortened the reserve clause to only six years, not an entire career. Baseball was finally becoming free. Kurt Flett's case inspired athletes in all professional sports to challenge their reserve clauses in the 1970s and 80s. The National Basketball Association allowed players to solicit offers from other teams. NFL and NHL players would also be granted free agency in the years to come. The ability to solicit one's talent and be fairly compensated by one's team allowed for the normalization of million-dollar salaries made by athletes today, like Shaquille O'Neal with a $110 million contract with the Los Angeles Lakers, Chad Brown, a $24 million free agent contract with the Seattle Seahawks, Albert Bell of a more than $50 million free agency contract with the Chicago White Sox. Additionally, the Curb Flood Act of 1998 was passed posthumously after Flood lost his battle with cancer. The act limits baseball's antitrust exemption to only certain conduct of Major League Baseball, continuing to fulfill what Flood fought for. Flood was a part of a legacy of black athletes using their platform to create change. The question for fans is, how do we respond?